Is life really just a big cosmic accident? Because I was still an atheist and my heart was still hard a little bit, it was difficult for me to believe at first. So I needed a lot of evidence to actually agree with this. If I looked at a computer and said, oh, look at the way that the, that metal just happened to just come together and made a supercomputer. Oh, look how it just happened to happen. That is so irrational. He said I'll rise on the third day and he did. He rose on the third day and he proved to be God. So So basically, I was an atheist before. Uh, for 23 years of my life, I just turned 24. But I was on my 23rd birthday, I started really questioning like, the meaning of my life and wondering, you know, is life really just a big cosmic accident? Is the meaning of life just to chase the biggest dopamine rush through whatever? Because, you know, I used to smoke a lot of weed, party, fornication, and all these things that the Lord abhors, right? But, you know, I didn't think it was a problem, but deep down in my soul, I knew there was something wrong and none of this was deeply going to fulfill me. I was very depressed, even at times suicidal, because I was thinking... So, um, I realised there must be a greater meaning to life. I had a revelation uh, at the time, which was, you know, no, most of the world currently, 8 to 9% of the world, believes in some type of God, and 99% of all of human history, you know, believes in some type of God, right? So, I had to ask myself, you know, there must be something going on here, right? Like, I mean, I can't just be some super smart, enlightened person like a lot of atheists believe they are. But I thought, hey, you know what? Even if I don't end up believing the stories of the Bible or whatever, let me just like pick up this book. Maybe I'll gain some wisdom or get a better understanding for meaning in life. And from reading the scriptures, it's really weird when a book talks to you, really. And I'm just from reading even just from Genesis, because I don't even understand the fact that the Bible was 66 books, leading to the Old Testament and New Testament. I didn't understand any of that, so I just thought it was one big book. Uh, I never went to church when I was younger, so I had no education on it. No one evangelized or preached to me. It's like, why I know this was a gift from God. But anyway, I saw from Genesis and I immediately realized this is a God who is actually forgiving and merciful and patient. And despite my downfalls, I already saw the mercy of him just from Genesis. So after I finished Genesis, I thought, okay, the Old Testament's a little bit long, so I'm not going <laughs> to read through the whole New Testament before I get to the Gospels. So then, yeah, I start reading the Gospel of Matthew first, actually. And once I get to his Sermon on the Mount, I realize this man is an ethical genius. And this is someone whose moral standard I want to live up to, you know. And he's really touching me in the heart. And I was repeating it over and over again, reading it over and over before I even finished. So, but yeah, after once I'd gone through this and seen the claims that Christianity makes about Jesus rising from the dead and, you know, being the atonement for forgiveness of our sins, you know, I... I wanted to believe that in my heart but because I was still an atheist and my heart was still hardened a little bit it was difficult for me to uh, believe at first so I needed a lot of evidence to actually agree with this essentially right so I got I went on a little bit of an investigation and I sort of was looking into the if there was real historical evidence for whether Jesus really rose from the dead or not whether he was even a real person right and all the claims that I made about him and all of the sources that we have on in history essentially from the Romans from the Jews from the Gentiles and the Bible itself of course in the accounts of Matthew Mark Luke and John all attest to the fact that Jesus was a real person that he really died by crucifixion and there was an empty tomb after three days and even atheistic scholars like Bart Ehrman say that if there's any fact we can know about history it's that Jesus lived up to all three of these things essentially so uh, I had to ask myself with this in mind and the fact that uh, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15 that there were over 500 witnesses who had seen the risen Jesus and that he'd appeared to multiple people, multiple apostles over that 40 day period after him resurrecting. In addition to that, and there's no other sources that refute that, those facts, by the way. And uh, the fact that most of the people of those 500 were still alive when Paul had written that letter obviously showed that those people in Corinth could have just went back and verified whether those people had really seen the risen Jesus, you know, and I haven't seen anything to refute those facts either. So how do you reconcile all these facts? And here's the big one, the fact that all of his apostles were, that we know of went and mart were martyred and died bloody death, not because of what they believed, but what to, they have claimed to have seen. And, you know, that is, you know, maybe you can explain the way one person willing to die and being crazy or something. But all of them, like, like, we're talking dozens of people. So when I'm equating all these facts together, I'm realizing that my, there's nothing, I, there's no way I can logically work around this. All the evidence is pointing to the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and 
he is reliable. And you have to either conclude that he, when he claimed to be God, that he's either a liar, a lunatic, or who he claimed to be. Because a lot of people say he's just a good teacher, but that doesn't really make sense. He can't just be a good teacher or a prophet if he claimed to be God. Because if I give you good advice, you know, or give you guys good advice, and then I say, oh, do you know why my advice is so good? It's because I'm God. You know, I'm a manipulator or I'm crazy, right? So we, but reading the, the writings, you know, based on Jesus' life, you have to conclude that this guy wasn't a lunatic. This guy's a sane person and he had a head of the That's why we as a society today even take for granted Judeo-Christian yeah. values and especially the teachings of <laughs> Jesus, even atheists, they <laughs> can't deny that it's the teachings of Jesus that we live by today, even subconsciously. But anyway, so I I believed in Jesus at this point, but then I, but then I, I was still an atheist, but now then I actually looked into the cosmological, the cosmological argument, which uh, William Lane, Lane Craig promotes a lot, which is just about the fact that you know, our universe is so finely tuned for life that it's like, how can you possibly say that this is an accident? And looking into little things like, if the sun was, sorry, if the earth was slightly close to the sun, we'd burn up, if it was slightly further away, we'd freeze to death. Looking at all this and looking at the fact that every single cell in our, uh, in our body is so, so complex and intricately designed. If, if I looked at a computer and said, oh, look at the way that that, that metal just happened to just come together and make a supercomputer. Oh, look how it just happened to happen. That is so irrational that it takes an incredible faith to put my atheism, I realize it's bankrupt because adding up all these things and the fact that even if the gravitational constant was just one of like the many constants that, physical constants that govern our universe were different by like one times 10 to the power of 60, you know, the whole universe would either collapse in on itself if it was slightly stronger or if it was slightly weaker, then everything would have scattered so far apart that there would be no possibility for life to exist as it is today. So, and that's only scratching the surface. But even just with that alone, I realized there has to be a God that exists. And then weighing this up with the evidence about what Jesus, how he lived his life, how he died on the cross, forgiving his enemies and teaching amazing ethical teachings but most importantly the historical evidence pointing to that he was reliable and he said I'll rise on the third day and he did he rose on the third day and he proved to be God so you have to make a decision are you going to put your faith in him or not and I realised I was convicted that I had to essentially and even through prayer and realising that this man can actually change my life for real I used to be addicted to weed you know I was on antidepressants but I quit them cold turkey and you know I don't need I don't because I've got the Holy Spirit in me so I don't need drugs to make me happy anymore in fact they'll probably make me more depressed I, you know and I, I believe firmly that they're from Satan like <laughs> to be honest but it might, it might be controversial but like it's that was I think we only need absolute. the Holy Spirit in Jesus to make us happy in our life we don't need we don't need all these drugs we don't need pornography we don't need to have sex like uh, you know chase the highest dopamine possible just simply just being in the presence of God you know is, is the most amazing thing ever and um, you know I heard a quote which was that eternity doesn't start when when you die uh, you know eternity starts when you put your faith in Jesus and I love Romans 6.23 for the way to sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life you know, every other religion teaches you you have to work your way to heaven whether it's Catholicism saying that you have to follow the seven sacraments or whether it's Islam saying you have to follow the five pillars of Islam or whether it's Judaism is saying you have to follow the 613 commands of the Torah. But the Bible says that if you suffer on just one part of the law, it's as if you've broken all of them. You know, and there's no way we can live, possibly live up to a totally holy and perfect God. There's no way that that's possible. So that's why the blood of Jesus is so essential. But yeah, anyway, so yeah, that's essentially my testimony. And uh, I feel like, uh, you know, if this inspires you, like, you know, that's all I can ask for. But if you are skeptical about Jesus, then no, I just want you to, I just want you to be open minded, read the Bible charitably, and, and ask yourself, is Jesus someone I can put my faith in? You've got the evidence, the historical evidence for Jesus' existence and his life and the way he died. And ask yourself, is this someone I can rely on? If you don't believe there's a God looking for the cosmological argument, and really ask yourself, do you, is it really rational to believe there's no God and behind our consciousness, our sense of morality? Is that really rational? And I say no, there's no way it's rational. I think if you think about it long enough, you'll realise it's not rational.
But anyway, wherever you are in your journey, I pray right, in the name of Jesus that He can help reveal Himself to you. Even if you just go in your room and just say, Jesus, if you're real, reveal yourself to me sincerely and humbly. Reveal yourself, Jesus. And if you can, if you can really do that, I promise you, you will feel the presence of His life, of Him in your life. And uh, I pray that for whoever is watching this, that. Um, Jesus does touch you because he's transformed my life and transformed so many people here's lives and I know you can transform your life as well so God bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. Mm -hmm.